Right division. Why bother? What's the big deal with right division? And does it really matter? Greetings, I'm Dr. Paul Felter. Welcome to my video podcast where I expose church fallacies and flawed Christian traditions with Bible truth. I let the Bible speak for itself. Please visit my website for additional resources, including my book, The Master Key to Understanding the Bible, a comprehensive guide to rightly dividing the word of truth. In this video, I will answer the previous questions by explaining why right division is so vitally important. I will examine five critical elements of right division essential for your spiritual maturity and edification. Number one, truth. Number two, God's approval. Number three, salvation. Number four, eternal security. And number five, our destiny. Each of these elements is fundamental to your correct understanding of God's word. Lacking comprehension in these five areas fosters the misapplication of scripture, acceptance of false doctrine, reliance on denominational doctrines and traditions, and reliance on pastors and teachers, resulting in fear, confusion, and misplaced trust. Okay, so let's get right into it. Number one, truth. Well, truth should be obvious. To properly understand anything, you must have the truth. Otherwise, you are deceived. Sadly, few in the postmodern church diligently seek the truth. Most want their ears tickled and their egos stroked. There are plenty of pastors doing just that, as that brings in the money. Dying to self and suffering for Christ are not topics that fill the offering plate. But truth is paramount from God's perspective, as the word truth is used 235 times in the King James Bible. Let's read a few verses from the Psalms. Lead me in thy truth, and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Psalm 25, verse 5. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Psalm 91, 4. For the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Psalm 100, verse 5. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Psalm 145, verse 18. Here are some passages from John's Gospel. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1, verse 17. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such who worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verses 23 and 24. And we all know this one. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verse 32. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak for he will show you things to come. John 16, verse 13. A few more from the Apostle Paul. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Romans 1, 18. Rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. Am I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? Galatians 4.16 Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Galatians 5.7 For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Ephesians 5.9 Stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6.14 That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2.12 Who would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. 
a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. 1 Timothy 2, verses 4 and 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. 2 Timothy 4, verse 4. As you can see, without the truth, you cannot please God. Without the truth, your worship is unsound and your understanding flawed. So how does one find the truth? Well, that brings us to the next point. Number two, God's approval. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15 how to find the truth. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's break this verse down by asking a few questions. How are we approved by God? Well, we must study the word of truth, the Bible. What is the methodology of proper study? Rightly dividing the word of truth, the Bible. Not harmonizing the scriptures, which is what most pastors and teachers do. Bible colleges and seminaries also teach the supposed harmony of scripture. But the Holy Spirit teaches just the opposite, to rightly divide the word of God. So what are we to divide? Well, let's start with the first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1 In the beginning, God created two realms, heaven and earth. At the end of Revelation chapter 21, God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Revelation 21.1 Since God created two realms, heaven and earth, that will continue into eternity future with the new heaven and the new earth, he has a plan for each realm. God's plan for the earth is focused around Israel, and his plan for heaven with us, the body of Christ. That is the first major division in Scripture you must recognize and understand. God has a plan for Israel on the earth and a separate plan for the body of Christ in heavenly places. If you do not separate Israel from the church, the body of Christ, you will be perpetually confused, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. In the book of Genesis, God uses the word earth 121 times defining the characteristics and parameters of planet Earth. The word heaven is used 30 times, mostly about the Earth's atmosphere, not the heavenly abode of God. The entire Old Testament pertains to God's plan for the Earth using men like Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, King David, Solomon, Isaiah, and the prophets. Even the Old Testament prophets spoke of earthly things, like the day of the Lord and the restoration of Israel's kingdom, the millennial kingdom. Jesus, John the Baptist, and the twelve disciples preached the gospel of the kingdom, an earthly kingdom promised to Abraham and prophesied by Israel's prophets. But what about the heavenly places? There are a few verses in Isaiah chapter 6 that speak about God's throne and heavenly angels but the context is Isaiah's commission as a prophet to deliver God's warnings to the people of Israel and Jerusalem. The same with Ezekiel chapter 1 of his writing. He sees the Lord and some heavenly beings preparing him for his mission to the children of Israel beginning in chapter 2, verse 3. Nowhere in the Old Testament does God reveal his plan or program for heavenly places, as the Apostle Paul clearly states. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Romans 16 verse 25. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7 whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, 
as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ephesians 3, verses 4 and 5. The mystery of Christ was revealed to the apostles and prophets via the Holy Spirit working through the Apostle Paul as he taught the mysteries throughout the region. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 9. The hidden wisdom or plan of God was uniquely different from everything written in the Old Testament scriptures. You have most likely heard the bogus saying that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. That is absolute rubbish. Nothing could be further from the truth. That is the sort of cliched nonsense taught in so-called Bible colleges and seminaries. The hidden wisdom of God's plan for heaven is nowhere found in the Old Testament, as Paul clearly states. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 8. Unsearchable means just that. It cannot be searched out. It is not hidden in the Old Testament. It is hidden in God, who revealed it first to the Apostle Paul, not via the Old Testament, but by divine revelation, as Paul states. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 4. Jesus told the Jews the following, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John 5, 39. The searchable things of Christ and the unsearchable riches of Christ are not the same. They must be different. The searchable things of Christ are in the Old Testament. The unsearchable riches of Christ were revealed to Paul and are found in his writings, Romans through Philemon, not in the Old Testament. If you do not understand these things, then you will be ashamed when standing before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Study to show thyself approved of God. God's approval at the judgment seat of Christ is another critical reason for right division. Number three. Salvation. This is a big one. If you get this wrong, it will have eternal consequences. Most Christians believe there is only one saving gospel in the whole Bible. They think the Old Testament saints looked forward to the cross of Christ and we look back to the cross. Well, the last half of that sentence is true. But no one in the Old Testament nor the four gospels looked forward to the cross only Jesus. The disciples looked forward to the kingdom being restored to Israel. They did not see the full impact of the cross in Acts chapter 1 when they asked Jesus the following. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Acts 1 verse 6. Let's go back in history. What was Adam's gospel? Well, simple obedience to God's command not to eat the forbidden fruit. Noah's gospel was to build an ark. Abraham's gospel was to leave Ur and go to a land God would show him. From Moses to Paul, the gospel was to keep the commandments. The current gospel for the dispensation of grace is as follows. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. Does it get any clearer? No, it doesn't. The current and only gospel that saves 
is that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, was buried, and rose from the grave on the third day. No other gospel will save one soul today. Looking at the New Testament, there are four gospels. Number one, the gospel of the kingdom was preached by John the Baptist, Jesus, and his disciples. Number two, the believe and be baptized gospel of Matthew 28 and Mark 16, erroneously called the Great Commission. Number three, Paul's gospel of grace in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we just read. And number four, the everlasting gospel of Revelation 14. An interesting fact about the gospel of the kingdom is that it will be preached again during the seven-year tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, along with the everlasting gospel. But currently, the only gospel that saves is number three, the gospel of grace. The believe and be baptized gospel began after Jesus' resurrection and continued via the preaching of Jesus' disciples to the Jews into the first century, but ceased with their martyrdom and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. By then, Paul's gospel was the prominent gospel throughout the Near East and Southern Europe. During this present dispensation of grace, neither the gospel of the kingdom nor the gospel of believe and be baptized nor the everlasting gospel will save your soul. Again, the only gospel in operation today is the gospel of grace. Number three, Paul makes that point very clear in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Any pastor, teacher, or theologian preaching anything other than the gospel of grace is accursed. They are vile, damned, detestable, abominable, and loathsome. Of course, that includes all the popular false gospels like the religious or works gospel, I am a good moral person gospel, the prosperity, word of faith, name it and claim it gospel of health, wealth and happiness, the self-help gospel or your best life now gospel, signs and wonders gospels, the tongues gospel and Pentecostalism, social justice gospel, feed the poor, heal the sick, honorable endeavors, but that alone won't save anyone. And finally, the universal or inclusive gospel that since God is love, we are all saved in the end. All of those Gospels are another Gospel, and they that preach them are accursed. I don't care how nice of a person they are, how big their church is, they are accursed. Those that preach the above false Gospels or any other false Gospel are accursed by God. All false Gospels marginalize or ignore Jesus' death for their sin and elevate personal actions, and attributes. They minimize the cross while elevating the individual's efforts and accomplishments. False gospels are man-centered. The true gospel of grace is Christ-centered. Christ died for our sin. Christ was buried. Christ arose on the third day. The only part you play is to believe. No good deeds or personal actions are required. The Apostle Paul sums it up nicely in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Personal actions, good deeds, reputation, or social standing play no part in your salvation. It is a gift from God, by his grace alone, bestowed through our faith. Many pastors and teachers seem to think that John 3.16 is our gospel. But is that true? Let's read it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That passage is certainly true, but it does not specify exactly what to believe about Jesus. 
If you believe that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth, will that knowledge give you everlasting life? No, of course not. If you believe that Jesus was or is the Messiah of Israel, will that save you today? No, of course not. Back when these words were spoken by Jesus to Nicodemus, believing in Jesus as Messiah, Lord and Savior, was crucial for salvation. However, that dispensation of law has passed. Believing in Jesus as Messiah will not save anyone in the present dispensation of grace. Only the gospel of grace saves today, 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, as previously noted. So, as true as John 3.16 is, it is not our gospel. Now, let me take a moment here and explain something. John 3.16 is true, it has been true, it will always be true. But here you have an example of taking a biblical concept, something that is true, and misapplying it, and putting it in God's timeline where it does not belong, thus creating error. This is a critical thing you must understand. There are many, many true statements in the Bible, but if you misapply them and put them in the wrong place in God's timeline, they become error. This is what's so confusing to people. Pastors and teachers erroneously take scriptures, take them out of their context, put them in some place in the God's timeline where they don't belong, and they become error, but people can't see it because it's a true scripture. But it's only been misapplied, misused, misquoted, and taken out of context. John 3.16, as true as it is, is not our gospel. It does not apply specifically to the gospel or to the dispensation of grace, even though it is true. Our gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, period. Nothing else. Everything else, Paul says, is what? A curse. Make sure you understand this because it is a critical factor. Okay, getting back to the text. Understanding the proper gospel is a crucial matter. If you have believed a false gospel, then you are not saved. No matter how sincere you may be and all the activities you may do in the church, it's meaningless. This is why right division is so vitally important. Right division points solely to Paul's gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, as the only means of salvation, thus eliminating any confusion which might arise from passages in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Hebrews through Revelation. Paul writes about the gospel of Jesus that was committed to him. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, what? According to my gospel. That's the 1 Corinthians 15 gospel. Romans 2, 16. Make sure you believe the right gospel. Your eternal destiny depends on it. Number four, eternal security. I am amazed at how many Christians are uncertain about going to heaven. Some think that if they sin, they could lose their salvation. Others wonder if they have done enough to be worthy of heaven. One troublesome passage that confuses many believers is found in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. The passage clearly states that if one falls away, it is impossible to regain salvation. Sadly, many pastors preach this verse as if it applies to us, the body of Christ, enhancing their egos, power, and control over their church by instilling fear in believers. However, the book of Hebrews was not written to us, the body of Christ, but to who? Hebrews, Jews. A common misconception is that the book was written to Hebrew Christians. There is no such thing as a Hebrew Christian, because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. To understand the intended audience of the book of Hebrews, we need only review verses 1 and 2 of the first chapter. 
God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Hebrews was written over 1900 years ago. The fathers were the fathers of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The prophets were Samuel through Malachi. Clearly, the audience is Israel. When Jesus the Son spoke, he spoke to Israel during his earthly ministry. Jesus told us to whom he came to minister. Matthew 15, verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul reiterates Jesus' ministry in Romans 15, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. The circumcision is Israel, not Gentiles. You are not the circumcision, nor the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hebrews is written to Jews, but what is the time frame? The writer also clearly states, that it is the last days. The last days from a Jewish perspective is the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble culminating with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the application of the book of Hebrews is the seven-year tribulation, not this present dispensation of grace. The falling away refers to a Jew falling away from faith in Jesus to follow the Antichrist and take his mark. There will be no repentance during the tribulation for taking the mark of the beast. But that is then, not now. Another passage frequently used to support the bogus concept of losing one's salvation is 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20-22. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Remember, Peter is an apostle to the Jews, not the Gentiles. Paul, writing in Galatians chapter 2, clarifies that for us. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that would be Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that worked effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, that we should go to the heathen, that would be Gentiles, and they to the circumcision. Galatians 2, 7-9. Peter's ministry was to the circumcision, Israel. So, since his ministry, apostleship, and gospel are to Israel, to whom do you think he wrote in his epistles? Gentiles? No, of course not. Peter wrote to Israel, Jews, not the church, the body of Christ. In Peter's first epistle, he sets the background for his intended audience. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. First Peter 1, verses 1, 5, and 7. Let's review these highlighted phrases. Scattered strangers. Strangers scattered in Gentile regions of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia are Jews. Jews are strangers in Gentile regions. Peter's intended audience is Jews living outside the land of Israel. 
Salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Salvation was not an immediate possession, but would be revealed to those believing in Jesus Christ at the appearing of Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the last time. Season, manifold temptations, trial of your faith, tried by fire are all references to the seven-year tribulation, appearing of Jesus Christ. That is the second coming at the end of of the trial by fire, the seven-year tribulation. Peter wrote to Jews about enduring the tribulation until the second coming of Jesus Christ. So, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20-22 pertain to Jews enduring the tribulation and has no present application to us, the body of Christ. Right division eliminates confusion about the books of Hebrews through Revelation as they apply to Israel in the seven-year tribulation, and not to the present dispensation of grace. Remember what I said about erroneously applying scriptures to places in the timeline where they don't belong. What does our Apostle Paul write about eternal security? Romans chapter 8 is rich with verses proclaiming our eternal security in Christ. Here are a few excerpts. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, to them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8, 35 and 37. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39. According to as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1, 10 and 11. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30 The day of redemption is the rapture. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Colossians 2.13 you and I have been forgiven all trespasses, not just past ones, not just a few here and there, but all past, present, and future. Let's condense the previous passages. There is no condemnation. We are free from the law of sin and death. We are conformed to the image of Jesus, God's Son. We are predestinated, called, justified, and glorified. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are inseparable from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. 
we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are sealed until the day of redemption. We are quickened together with him, Jesus, having forgiven us all trespasses. We are eternally secure in Christ based on what God has done through Jesus Christ, not what we have or have not done. Salvation is by grace. You did nothing to earn it and can do nothing to lose it. It is a gift from God through faith and faith alone. Number five, our destiny. God's plan for us in heavenly places was kept secret until revealed to the Apostle Paul, and for good reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What's so stunning about the hidden wisdom is that had Satan and his minions known it, they would not have crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two major points in the hidden wisdom unknown to Satan. A, Gentile salvation, and B, the body of Christ destiny. Let's look at Gentile salvation first. For millennia, Satan had the Gentiles in his back pocket, so to speak. They were godless pagans, as the Apostle Paul writes, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2, verse 12. Gentiles were aliens, strangers to God's program for Israel. They were without God and had no hope. They were under the dominion of Satan with no means of salvation except converting to Judaism and becoming a proselyte. But the prospect for Gentile salvation changed with the crucifixion of Jesus. Paul continues in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Gentiles who were once far off, are now saved and brought near to God by the blood of Christ shed for the remissions of sin on the cross. Even at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, none fully understood God's purpose with the cross as we read what Peter spoke of Jesus in Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. In Acts chapter 2, Peter was not preaching salvation via the cross of Christ, but accusing Israel of killing their Messiah. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Acts 2 verse 23. Peter was not yet aware of the redemptive power of the cross of Christ that would extend to the Gentiles Neither was Satan and his minions. That knowledge and understanding would come later via the Apostle Paul. Gentiles can be saved by simple faith in Jesus, that he died for our sin, was buried, and rose again the third day. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Had Satan known that Gentiles could be saved by grace through simple faith in Jesus, he would have done everything he could to prevent the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the next point. What is the purpose of saving millions of Gentiles by grace through faith? Paul tells us that our destiny lies in heavenly places. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 3. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2 verse 6. For our conversation, citizenship, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3 verse 20. 
For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made of hands, eternal in the heavens. Our destiny is heavenly places. We are eternal in the heavens, not on the earth. The earth is Israel's domain. We are already citizens of heaven. But what will we be doing in heaven? That is a question few can answer. I have never heard a sermon on that topic. First, let's look at the hierarchy of heavenly places. For by him, that would be Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians 1, verses 16 and 17. There are thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers, both on earth, the visible, and in heaven, the invisible. There are spiritual entities and positions of authority in the heavenlies, exerting influence over the leaders of nations on earth, some to do evil, some for good. One-third of the angels in positions of authority in heaven rebelled against God to follow Satan. Their influence in our world is purely evil. Since the true nature of man is evil, the evil influence of fallen angels is well received. Just look at the world in which we live. Evil, violence, and corruption are everywhere. Paul tells us of the spiritual corruption and wickedness in heavenly places in the following familiar verse. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.12 But the influence of evil from fallen angels is not permanent, but temporary. There is coming a day when Satan and his angels are removed from the heavenly authoritative hierarchy of thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. Satan and his fallen angels are cast out of heaven. That happens at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. The positions of thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers previously occupied by evil angels are then vacated as Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven to the earth. That brings us to the body of Christ's destiny. So, Satan and his angels are cast out of heavenly places of authority. The heavenly positions in question here are the thrones, dominions, principalities, powers created by and for Jesus Christ. So how and with whom are those vacated positions of authority in heaven filled? Paul answers that question in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. And what is the exceedingly greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. How does Jesus fill all and all? With us, the church, his body. That is another passage on which you have never heard a sermon. But let's break it down. Exceeding greatness of his power the surpassing power of God over and above all else. Usward who believe. Paul is writing to the church, us, the body of Christ. We are the recipients of God's exceeding greatness of his power, which he wrought in Christ. God's power to us is fashioned and manifested in Jesus Christ. God raised Christ from the dead and set him at his right hand in heavenly places, precisely where we are are going in the rapture to heavenly places. Jesus is seated far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, showing his ownership of those realms. All things 
in heaven and earth are under Jesus' feet, meaning he has complete authority over all things. Jesus is also the head of the church, having complete authority over the church, which is his body. Jesus will give all things to the church, principality, power, might, and dominion. We are the fullness of him. He will fill all in all with us, his body. We will fill the positions of principality, power, might, and dominion in heavenly places. Well, praise the Lord. From heavenly places, principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions, we will rule and reign with Jesus over the new heaven, the vast universe of God's creation, while Israel rules and reigns with Jesus over the earth. All things will finally be gathered together in Christ, both in heaven and in earth, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. Ephesians 1 verse 10. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope this study gave you sufficient reason for learning right division. Until next time, God bless. Just a quick update on my physical condition. I'm still in uh, rehab doing physical therapy, occupational therapy. I'm getting around mainly on a walker now, which is good. And as my balance improves, I will go to the quad can and then hopefully just walking freestyle. So I just want to thank you for your continued support and prayers. And uh, may the Lord richly bless each one of you. Have a good day. God bless.